Hello, everybody. We meet again for the second session of our uh, book uh, review. So uh, we will start where we left off last time. In the first session, it was just an introductory session. Uh, we explained things that we needed uh, on the way. So, for example, we explained in the beginning uh, the concept of uh, universal harmony, the universal order, and the concept uh, how it has to do with excellence, connecting the lower with the higher to achieve excellence, as we only see 1% uh, of reality with our senses. We only perceive 1%, but the 99% is unperceived. So in order to bring excellence into our work, we have to let the 99%, the unperceived realms that go up to the spiritual, we have to let them govern our actions and come into the, the lower uh, 1% so that physical action becomes a harmonizing agent for the whole universe for all the other unperceived dimensions. And that is what we dealt with in explaining the first, uh, let's say, uh, seven lines that were in the introduction of the book. Now, then we went through the concepts of left brain mode perception, right brain mode perception, because here, we put the building blocks that we will use later on in everything that we explain. The difference between the two modes, the left brain, the analytical, diversifying uh, aspect, and the right one is the holistic uh, one, the extrasensory one, the right one, the extrasensory one that deals with the 99%, while the left one is only 1% and deals with our, uh, let's say, personality, our ego, our uh, linear time and space, and all that is left brain perception. So we went through that last time, because these are things that we're going to use as we go along. Now we're going to start with explaining what life force is. Because if you want to know what life force is, it is actually something that animates, brings to life, and moves everything in the universe, not only the one you see, but in the other universes you don't see. So life force is the animator. It's the cradle of life. There is no energy source that deals with everything in nature or in the universe, like life force. I mean, thinking of electrical energy, uh, oil, or whatever uh, kinetic uh, types of energy that you might have, these are all minute, negligible compared to life force. Even in our material world, you see the force that makes us move. We don't move by ourselves. There's a force, a fuel that makes us move. There is uh, a fuel that fuels our growth, the growth of plants and all that. Imagine the whole universe, uh, what moves the planets, uh, what, uh, I mean, what goes into, moves things from one dimension to the other through black holes and things like that. Uh, all that is life force. These are all different forms of life force. So where is the origin of this life force? This is the most potent thing that exists in the universe. All our senses are fueled by life force. And when we saw in the first book, the three verses I wrote, you make me see everything. This line means that I am fueled by the, all my senses are activated by this life force. It is actually the life force that brings life, that brings consciousness into 
my system and makes me see, makes me, so I'm just uh, a vehicle for life force. Nothing is generated in me. Life force contains consciousness. So it is what fuels my awareness. So all this is actually universal. It doesn't exist in me. When I look at life and when I look at perceived reality, let's see how life force works here. For me to perceive reality, my senses have to work. And if my senses work, that means they need blood. They need blood supply to the brain so that the different uh, brain areas start uh, somehow transforming the incoming vibrations into different sensory scales like color, sound and all that. So for my senses to work, the heart has to beat first. My organs have to be alive. So perceived reality as we see it, and perceived reality, we have studied even in our foundation levels, that perceived reality, this solid world that you see here, is created by a projection of the brain coming, collecting the senses, creating this reality from association with the content in our brains, with our database, and then projecting it on the total uh, absolute reality. The total absolute reality is formless. So we project on it the certain codes that produce the inner vision on the outer world and then the senses actually produce our outer world. So even matter, materialization, when I see this is material, this is the result of my senses. Because what to me is material could be non-material to other species and vice versa. So even the materiality of the world is a sensory phenomena. So for this world to exist and the senses to work, the life in, in my body must be somehow activated. I must have a living body. So all my organs have to work and then life comes and then my heart beats and then sensory perception starts. So the whole world that you see in front of you is a secondary phase. The first phase is totally unperceived. It's on the unconscious level where you have the 99% working in your body. So when your heart is beating, uh, when your digestive system is working and all that, it is actually the universe working through you because you don't exist yet. The universe works through you and you only exist when the senses start working. Then you feel your existence, then you feel your body, you feel all that. You don't even have a feeling of your own body unless the senses start working. So look at it that way. The, all the laws of, let's say, biological function, running the biological functions in the body, are actually universal laws. So everything in your body, your heartbeat, is the universe beating. It's not you yet, because that's the first level before you start existing. So it's the heart of the universe beating. You think it's your own heart, but Actually, it's the heart of the universe. It's the pulse of the universe beating in there. So how can all this be achieved? These are all functions of the universal life force. So let's go to the beginning to understand what life force is. Where does it come from? So I'll go to the beginning. We will make, we'll start by 
drawing just a point to start with a point like this I'll make it big, bigger like this so that you can see it okay so this is a point now if you look at the point this could be a center a point or could be a circle could be a sphere that means it can manifest as a point or as a circle depending on my perception of it but that means something that is equally a point and a circle that is equally center and periphery means it is beyond time and space so we are here at a level here a first level that what we call the zero equals infinity this is the zero equal infinity level this is actually the everything and nothing in one you can't call it everything because it's at the same time and nothing you can't call it nothing because it's everything because there's no duality so when there's no duality there are no attributes there's nothing but this nothing contains everything so this is the level that we call divinity or you can call it in any way you want but this level because it it is the center and the periphery at the same time you should look, look at it as the originator but at the same time the container because it's the center and the the whole so it's the originator and container of creation so creation is centered and activated by the zero or the nothing and at the same time it is not only activated by the zero but creation is contained within the zero this is a bit a very difficult thing to comprehend we are contained in a cradle of nothing and animated from a center of nothing and then all of existence exists in there so what happens here in order for creation to occur we need an intermediate level here before creation here you have duality duality that's creation everything is here everything and, and its opposite in harmony because here once you have duality if everything splits into two opposites like this positive and negative let's say two opposites you don't have creation because opposites are uh, by definition they're opposites of one thing so they will tend to come back together in, into the one thing into their source so opposites coming fr from something will tend if they drift far away from each other they will end up dissipating into nothingness again if they touch each other they're in the center again so creation is not possible with just by duality it needs a law that harmonizes duality so for all, for us to imagine everything in creation we have to imagine first the laws that give stability to the instable situation of duality in order to have creation so the laws here would be one of the laws would be the centering law the law that relates how something centers something else so this law is 
the law that defines the relationship between now here you have a point and and periphery at the same time now we separate them a bit there's a law that produces a point in a circle this is not the point in a circle that, that, that will that we have here that's going to to come here this is the law that is going to govern this motion so here this is an area that is a sort of poten an area of potentiality an area that gives where consciousness manifests from this level conscious and unconscious are the same here consciousness starts to manifest consciousness here it starts to manifest here through laws first so there is the centering law there is a law of time the law of time because duality is pulsating is a pulsating duality and in order to have a pulse you need a law of time like this here a, a law that can produce a pulse that, that can produce this shape you, you, you need a law for that so all the laws here that are going to be active here they exist on this level many ancient traditions call this level the primordial ocean or the primordial fog because this is a level uh, from which everything arises when they call it primordial ocean or primordial fog we should not look at it as the element of water it, it is not it's a primordial ocean it's an ocean that contains the four qualities of humidity water dryness earth and then fire and air so uh, electromagnetic radiation for example our universe the electromagnetic universe is is coming from sparks coming out of where of the water so actually fire the sparks of the electromagnetic universe that we know have their origin in water but this is not water as we know it this primordial water is to be understood as the cradle or the container of all the laws that we need in creation they exist here that's why the ancient Egyptians looked at this primordial ocean called it the noon the noon and then creation starts as a small mound rising from the noon so this is creation so creation is a small this is the waters and then a mound something arises okay now for the law here that the centering law that produces a relationship that governs those two opposites how do you govern the relationship of two opposites by having a law of motion a motion that holds them in check so that they don't get too near or too far but how will it hold them like this it takes them into a circular motion so the first motion is a circular motion so here we end up with a circular motion like this that governs duality but the circular motion is a result of two things the law of time the pulsating law because this is turning like this pulse and the centering principle and so these two produce a circular motion rotation so 
look at it like this. The first motion in the universe is a circular motion. What is this circular motion exactly here? We have the center that balances these two. But how does it look like? We are looking at it from the top here. Actually, this is, if you look at it, the circle motion, if you draw it in 3D, it becomes a vortex in 3D. This is the base of a vortex, a vortex where the circle motion goes up like this. And this vortex connects this center all the way to the origin. So it is this origin through this law here, this level, that connects here, produces the rotation in the form of a vortex. Now, this motion here is at the same time a pulsating motion. It's just not just strong. It's pulsating in many directions. It's pulsating in this direction, pulsating like this, and pulsating as it goes here, to move here. So all motion is in the form of pulses in both directions. Now we have what we call a wormhole, the centering principle. That's the spiritual animating what the animating all of creation. The animator is nothing. Animating everything as it holds it within nothing. So nothing. To animate everything, it holds it within nothing. So it creates the circle and the center at the same time. And between them, creation occurs. So where is life force? We are here, we're looking for life force. We didn't lose life force is the animating principle that comes out here using or, or being bound by the laws from here to create motion here. So in the center here, what we call BG3 axis here, the BG3 is the center of animation of the center that rotates the circle, that creates rotation. Here we see the motion coming down here. It actually doesn't come down. It, it's a centering principle that works from the top downwards to apply the law of centering to the rotation uh, here that produces the, the duality of creation. Now, what is happening here is actually the action of life force. The, the force that rotates this is not only a force of rotation, no, it is a force of animation too. It is actually here a conscious, animating, life-giving, motion-giving life force. So here it is consciousness with all the attributes of life that activates uh, the duality. And this is what is what we call life force. So life force has a path starting from the zero infinity states down to the state of potentiality or what we call the primordial ocean manifesting down here as life force. So now what we're going to do is examine the action of life force here. So 
here we have all the laws, we have the law of time, we have all that. So we want to examine this shape here, this shape of, it's a sort of a pulsating uh, rotation where the xeron creates the cycon. So let us look at it in a different way. So here, first we have a, a xeron, that's a center, xeron. And when the xeron expands in a circular manner that way, I'm going to take one of the axes. It actually expands in all directions. It creates a sphere. So the xeron through the law of time creates a sort of a periphery. Th this center is at the same time manifesting through a pulsating action as a container. So it's a center that manifests expands to become a container while still being a center. So it is equally like the beginning here, we said the dot is equally a center and the periphery. Here, this is differentiated. The center is here and then the periphery is here. Differentiating of the two states uh, in, in duality. And now we have this spherical shape that we call the cycon. So let us analyze why we call it the cycon. Until now, we have a zero at the center and an axis that is still, this axis is beyond time and space, beyond duality. The center is beyond duality and the periphery is beyond duality. So having a center, a motion and periphery, all this is beyond duality. So let us go into this container to discover the cycon, because the cycon exists within this non-dualistic container, we have duality of creation. So what happens is, as the center expands to create the periphery, every one of those axial motions here flows along there's a central axis here. The central axis is a zero axis. That means it is still not beyond time. It's still beyond time and space. So a, a motion, a spiraling motion starts forming around it like this because we know that the law of centering has a spiraling effect. So when it moves in here, it will move with a spiraling motion and come back again the spring with a spiraling motion. So it's a spring that moves out and in with a spiraling motion. This inner dualistic pulse going in and out, it's a pulse like that. It's a pulse that goes like this here. This is the beginning of duality or motion within creation. So we have a pulse here and we have a motion. A motion that starts at this point and moves here to this point. So we have what we have here is actually the creation of time and space. But there are endless axes in a spherical uh, expansion or a spherical pulse. So actually, one of them might be a linear time-space uh, expansion, but in reality, having all of them at the same time, so we have multiple multidirectional time-space movements creating all kinds of dimensions in all directions. We are going to take one of them one of those motions here on this axis 
and look at it. So we have here uh, an expanding spiral. This expanding spiral in the first motion in time and space, this is the archetype of all uh, radiating forces, all kinds of radiating forces. Uh, it's the uh, archetype of analytical forces. Uh, it's everything that has to do with expansion, analysis, and all that is, this is the prototype. This is the inner prototype of that. And when it's the spiral going in, is the prototype of all contraction forces going back to the center here. So the outgoing force here, as it goes out, the two spirals interact together anyhow. So there's always, in every step, you have an interaction of the outgoing and the ingoing spirals. And when I say here, uh, we have eight dimensions uh, like this, it, it goes into eight dimensions. Uh, one shouldn't look at the eight dimensions as if they were uh, quantitative dimensions, like the eight planes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No. Here we are speaking qualitatively, meaning that the motion here, when I say creates an eightfold motion, meaning that it is a motion that has the qualities of connection and stability at the same time, multidimensional connection with stability. That means we are here going towards the cycle. We're going into duality, into the creation of everything in duality. So what happens here in this motion? It's like, look at it, what's the qualitative aspect of the eight? It is like taking a square like this, representing here the quality of material presence of solidity. A square is like a block, a square block. And then I take another square like this. I, I'm rotating the first square in the second one. So I'm creating here a movement in the other direction, a movement in the central axis here. But this movement is at the same time through the two squares or through the number eight represents solidity and movement at the same time. So that's why we say here, this is uh, the quality of the eight is the support of creation. This quality of eight is the support of creation. Some scriptures refer to it as the eight angels supporting the throne of the divine or the eight angels supporting the throne of God. So, or uh, in ancient Egypt, when they start from the center, uh, creation is done through the Ogduad, that means the eight, the eight principles coming down. And then uh, the center forms the nine. So it's this quality of eight that is referred to in many, uh, ancient traditions. Now, the outgoing aspect interacting with the ingoing aspect creates the mind. So imagine the outgoing aspect is a mental activity, emotion that is radiating, that has a mental nature, that has a left brain quality, radiating, analytical, and all that. And the inner spiral has an emotional nature going in. So there's an outward movement and inward movement, mental, emotional. And when this, those two movements interact, you have a certain tension. So the mind is formed. The mind is formed by a sort of uh, perception, a sort of uh, movement outside, analytical uh, movement, and at the same time, it has this aspect of going in, the emotional aspect going in, gives it 
a sort of self-reflection. So this, you need this dual activity of reflection and self-reflection. You need the interaction of both to have the mind, because now the mind is in the, in the world of duality. So here, the universal mind is when consciousness moves outwards and inwards, creating reflection and self-reflection, this creates the universal mind. So the universal mind is created through a bi-directional movement of consciousness. And here, the universal mind, uh, you cannot separate uh, mental and emotional aspects because together they form the universal mind. The universal mind is not just mental energy, it's mental emotional. And this makes when you have hundreds, hundreds of these axes or in all directions, that means you have uh, an endless dimensions of interaction, of action of the universal mind. So the universal mind acts equally in all dimensions of creations. It's, it's a multidimensional thing. And when the universal mind is acting like that, it is reflection and self-reflection. So it imagines within itself all the contents of creation. So creation is imagined by the universal mind within the universal mind. So the universal mind is imagining within itself. So actually what happens is the universal mind imagines creation within the container, the zero container. So creation has at its origin nothingness, the nothingness and everything of the zero, and is contained in nothingness. And within that, we have the emotional, mental levels of creation here. So this is, that's why we call it the psychon. It's an emotional, mental construct. It's the first particle in creation. The first particle in creation cannot be in the electromagnetic range at the bottom uh, of the, uh, the planes here because we are speaking here zero and infinity, infinity, very fast uh, uh, level of uh, vibration here. As we go down, down, down to the speed of light, at the speed of light, some uh, fiery sparks erupt out of the primordial ocean. They only erupt out when, when we have a certain, uh, uh, when everything slows down to the speed of light. From our point of view, we look as everything speeding to the speed of light, but from creation point of view, everything slows down to the speed of light. Then at a certain moment, some fiery sparks uh, come out on the background in this subtle energy of the background. They come out of the primordial waters and every one of those sparks is a big bang. So when we speak about the first particles we're speaking within the big bang, this is a late stage. But here we're speaking about uh, endless levels of creation between the zero and w w where, I mean, and our world here, the Big Bang, we have endless, endless uh, levels of animated uh, life force, materialized uh, levels of creation. So you can have endless worlds existing beyond our uh, electromagnetic universe. They are all sort of compression 
wave uh, dimensions. But when I speak about compression wave dimensions up here, it's not exactly like the linear compression waves that, that we imagine. It's another type of compression waves. I mean, compression waves, uh, by compression waves, you understand the motion of air, water, and all that. It's somehow we, we look at it uh, moving in, in linear time, time space in, in a directional way. But here, we have compression waves, multidimensional compression waves that, that uh, go in all directions at the same time. So it's like spheres uh, coming out, and compression waves that are multiple spheres arising and ending. So then this is actually now the, the cycons are the building blocks or the first uh, particles of creation. And these particles are actually pulsating. Every cycon is a pulse. Now, there is a law here. You know, here we have the law of time, we have the law of centering. We have so many laws within the primordial ocean here. So one of those laws here is the law of resonance. With pulse and time, you always have laws of resonance. And what happens with the law of resonance? That means that every cycon, cycon pulse like this creates at the same time through resonance so many other levels of cycons from zero to infinity. And they are not separate. It's like an, a seamless uh, hierarchy of cycons that cover the whole universe from the smallest thing to the largest thing. You have a cycon pulse. So there, there is, for example, the pulse of creation of the universe. The day it begins and the day it ends is, is a huge, large pulse. Uh, it is also in resonance with smaller pulses, like our life is a pulse. The day I'm born and the day I'm, uh, I die is a smaller pulse. But this pulse is in resonance and part of the hierarchy of the pulse of the whole universe. So everything in the universe, all the pulses of the universe, are interconnected somehow, and there is information exchange between them. So when you're thinking of the first particle, it's not the second. It's not a particle at a certain uh, that has a certain dimension or something. It's it's a hierarchy of particles. It's a pulsating system uh, in the whole universe. Now. This very quick pulsating system, what will, if, if when something pulsates like that very quickly, it ends to look as if it's a stable thing. So if you take, for example, uh, here, if I take any frequency like this, and then I make it quicker and quicker and quicker, 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 and that comes a, a point here w w when it ends up as a line. So, cycon pulses, they pulsate, pulsate so quickly that actually they create a stable background that looks motionless. Now, this stable background that looks motionless is in reality a highly, highly energetic medium that has spiraling pulsations within it that is what we call torsion, spiraling. So the essence of this seemly inert background uh, subtle energetic medium is a highly par par uh, pulsating torsion medium. Now, this highly pulsating torsion medium in the background is what makes out of subtle energy is what gives it the aspect of life force because it it's in it it has all the laws of nature all those pulses here those eight level pulses and you know, when when i have pulses with those eight levels okay they support creation the eight 
but eight quality of eight outwards, quality of eight uh, backwards, they interact together, give me 64 qualities, and the 64 qualities in creation give me more qualities and so on. So actually, within here, all those qualities are laws of nature. Laws of nature are actually laws from here that become active here. They are laws from the primordial level that are activated here through the eight becoming 64 and so on. So here you have all the laws of nature in a highly, highly dynamic movement within uh, subtle energy forming what we call life force. And all those movements are actually what? All this is happening as a mind action, as consciousness. So life force is actually consciousness manifesting itself in many things. So consciousness is uh, like what Joseph Campbell sometimes calls when he refers to his mythology, consciousness is the hero uh, with a thousand faces. So it's like the creator with a thousand faces. So consciousness uh, manifests as all the different thousands of laws of nature. And this is life force. So life force is conscious mental uh, being running everything, let's say, in the universe and inside us. We deal, we breathe consciousness and breathe out consciousness. So life force is life, consciousness. Now, what happens in our bodies? All the laws here, running here, are actually manifesting in everything in creation. Psychons are everywhere in our body. So what happens here is life force manifests itself through different laws as the heartbeat, as the uh, every motion in the body from the smallest cells to the largest cells. It is actually the universe pulsating within you in every place. The sensory world we have, uh, th this world that we see in front of us, this material world and all that, is a very, very late stage because you need to have a living body so that the energy goes up to the brain, taking the blood to the brain so that the uh, senses start working. When the senses start working, then our perceived reality is projected. So actually, the world that we live in is a result of a living sensory process. And, but this sensory process is a late stage that comes after the functioning of all the attributes of life in the body, giving it life. So look at your body as a, a physical manifestation of the laws of the universe. When your heart beating, it is not your heart because it was beating before you became you, before you, an identity. Your heart had to beat first. Or every function in your body had to work first. So imagine that the biological functions in your body, all the life functions, the life force in your body, uh, running all those things, it's the universe living as you. The universe manifests itself as your body. And then, as a second phase, creates you. So what I think, me, my ego, and all that is only a secondary creation, floating on a universal life force construct that is my body. So here, when, when we look at life force as a mental, emotional thing, 
uh, let us go a step further and see what uh, this life force uh, I mean how it the effect of the second pulse because the inner the second pulse the inner second pulse actually is creates the uh, the life force so what happens is the medium that is created by all those pulses must through resonance the medium itself have this spiraling energetic effect at its core because it's a, another let's say hierarchy it's in resonance with its constituents so the elements constituting that medium are spiraling so the medium itself on a higher level must be spiraling now uh, the Russians proved this by uh, Kosirev the Russian he brought a sort of, of a glass jar like this and he put a pendulum here a, a disc like that suspended on a string and the plate here open well he did that in order to insulate the the pendulum from the outside and then he put a piece of ice here and let it melt he wanted to see uh, two things when ice melts there's a change of state and when ice freezes there's another change of state so in order to to look at the action of subtle energy he sees it best when something changes state so when this melt all of a sudden, there's a rotation here. That means that a change of state within subtle energy will produce rotation. That means when subtle energy moves, moves from ice to water, this motion has a spiraling core. And then the opposite if we get water and then we freeze it then the pendulum there will turn the opposite way showing again that energy when it is changing state from liquid to ice it is again it has a spiraling core so he called that torsion and he said uh, in entropy Entropy means when something uh, melts, it loses order. That means it is spreading, diversifying. So he calls that, we call that entropy. Entropy meaning loss of order. So it says when energy is spread out with the loss of order, this loss of order is actually based on a spiraling effect. And when you freeze ice, the gain of order is based on a spiraling effect. So he deducted that all energy actions must, in a way, uh, be based on torsion. And on that, the Russians have their own torsion physics. But we go with the second to the core of torsion they are working on the physical dimension we are working here from the level of creation where the torsion comes from and we know the torsion comes from the centering the law centering law that means the centering principle created by the zero and that's where the torsion uh, comes from now that means any external effect on my body because external effect is, is not, I'm part of the environment. I mean, the, I'm an open energy system. Energy goes in, goes out. And as we said, I'm just uh, the laws of the universe are running my whole system. 
So it's an open thing between uh, outside and inside. But this open motion, just like breathing in and out, this open motion must also be based on a, a spiraling effect when energy comes in and comes out. It's a spiraling effect. So the spiraling effects of energy coming into my body or affecting my body, any action outside will have a spiraling effect on my body. Whatever this action is, whether you're eating something, you're doing something, you're moving, all actions are based on spiraling effects. So any spiraling effect on my body will result in an outgoing reaction that is also spiraling. And that is what we call a qualitative torsion. Why do I call it qualitative torsion? Because while Kosir speaks here about a physical torsion in uh, subtle energy, we go much earlier than that. And our rotation here is a mental emotional construct. So we know that the cycle is a mental emotional construct. So torsion is a mental emotional uh, motion. So this mental emotional motion of consciousness is actually this my uh, emotional mental reaction to the incoming effect. So any effect on me will automatically produce spirals. And those spirals, whether the incoming ones or the outgoing ones, spirals are always in nature, origi they originate on emotional mental level. So that's why actually uh, every spiraling reaction is a quality, is an emotional mental quality. Uh, a qualitative reaction to the incoming spiraling uh, energy. So with this spiraling, we have, we can get, if I want to see how my body is interacting with the energy outside, that's the whole science of radiesthesia. That's the whole science of using pendulums. Why do pendulums rotate? Because the energy coming of my, out of my hand or out of my body or out of my organs, every energy coming in and out of everywhere, is rotating to begin with. So just to show that energy moves in and out in a spiraling effect, we hold the string and the weight. And this shows you the spiraling effect of energy coming in and out. So pendulums are a way of showing uh, the flow of energy in and out of the body and the direction of the spirals coming in and out and we start then taking that and putting uh, scales of calibration to it and all that so we can actually assess uh, the effect of incoming uh, qualities on the outgoing uh, reaction of quality so we call the spiraling effects coming out of the body we say we call that qualitative torsion because that's my response, my qualitative response to the incoming energy. And then we start uh, calibrating our instruments. Our instruments can be calibrated to right or left, depending right or left motion, uh, depending if I'm calibrating uh, at a certain length, I might enter into resonance with the outgoing uh, spiral, with another length I might be going in, uh, in with the ingoing spiral. So I usually choose a direction uh, to mean one thing and another direction to mean another. And that's how the science of radiesthesia here has to do with life force in the universe. So everything around us is just a manifestation of life force and our sensory apparatus shapes life force through the five senses, shapes this life force to create the material world. So 
every material object here is nothing but life force that the five senses interact with in a certain way and see the colors and hold the, see the, how it's solid, how it's material and all that. So this is the path of the Zeron to matter, because all this again, we end up again saying what? All this happens, this whole emotional, mental uh, psychon, uh, this universal mind. The universal mind is actually contained within this higher zero uh, state. Universal mind, mind is in duality. Duality is contained in non-duality and centered, balanced by non-duality. So, knowing this, what we do is, in order to make sure that everything that we know is within a balanced container with a balanced center, so this, the balancing of the center and the periphery comes from this connection to the zero and to the non-real, non-duality. Uh, so BG3 actually, BG3 is the road that takes you from duality to non-duality. And it manifests as a centering principle, creating rotation in everything, creating life force. So BG3 creates life force when I have here the vortex, the BG3 vortex. What happens is usually I get uh, within the, the background, the subtle energy background, I get this motion, this rotating motion here, creates a torus creates fields around it. There are fields created here. And those fields created around this BG3 communication thing are actually life force fields within duality that uh, actually are at the center of everything, are the pulsating centers of everything. So, if you look at the Sycon, the Sycon has endless number of toruses working in it. So imagine endless numbers of toruses like that working in it at the same time. So that means endless numbers of life force interactions around uh, BG3 communication. So, so we have endless communications from the center to the periphery. That means communicating everything in nature has to go through this axis and communicate with non-duality in order to uh, manifest here. You see, th there's a problem when trying to explain things non-duality and trying to explain all those things. Our uh, minds working in duality have a problem of expressing or understanding or even speaking about non-duality. That's why when I'm speaking to you, with every word I'm saying, a thousand other words come around it because it's, it's a very complex situation. The mind cannot understand what's happening on, the, on this level of uh, potentiality, the primordial ocean, and up there, it's the mind, there's no mind to begin with. Now, just a last point before we end this session is when a pulse is created, each one of those spiral effects, let's say, has a direction like that. It's I'm taking part of it. It, it, it goes like this. So there is emotion. You know, 
I can go up in this direction or in that direction. So there is a linear motion. Every pulse here, you, you feel that the pulse has a beginning and has an end. So every pulse in creation has a beginning and an end. My life has a beginning and an end and all that. But this concept of beginning and an end is a very limited concept for being living in the dimension of one of those axes here and seeing that means living in linear space-time. So every one of those axes here is a world of its own in linear space-time. And in linear space-time, things have a beginning and an end. But in reality, if you look at the whole cycle moving in all directions, so the, let's say, a pulse in the cycle here like this, a pulse like this, is actually, when you're looking at it from this point of view, is actually the center of the cycle expanding in both directions, creating beginning and end. So actually, here, the BG3 comes here, see, in this center, and through it comes the pulse, and the pulse creates beginning and an end. So it, it's just a point that expands, keeps expanding, creating this, expanding, creating this. So it creates a beginning and an end. So, but in reality, is they're all, both of them are two polarities of the center, coming in and out. So, from a higher point of view, things look different. From our left brain point of view, pulse has a beginning and an end. Life has a beginning and an end. You're born and you die. All this is left brain perception. Well, how is the right brain perception when you don't have the mind of uh, the mind working on a linear path? When you have the mind working on a multidimensional path, what happens? Multidimensionality means you're standing at the center. So actually, the, when you're standing at the center, you see the beginning and end. You see both ends just as aspects related to the center. So actually, the beginning and the end are two faces of one coin. You start looking, seeing them as the same thing expanding and contracting again, like if I hold this, I expand it like this and contract it again. So the beginning and end are enfolding out of a central point and falling back into it. That means the beginning affects the end and the end affects the beginning and the present state between them is affected by both of them. Beginning affects end, end affects beginning. Now, I'm going to show you a small experiment that we usually do. And uh, I'll show you how beginning affects end and end affects beginning. Uh, I'll make a very short example of this experiment that we, we do in our classes. I adjust my pendulum to my personal wavelength and I say a sound like uh, you see the pendulum that means this sound is expanding my energy okay let's try another sound e this is reducing my energy now in any in any wave like this that I see. You see, the angle at the beginning here represents the, or somehow influences the whole motion of the wave. If I change the angle, I change the amplitude straight away. You see? So the angle here affects it. So that means if you want to affect any situation, you put the quality at its beginning, 
it will affect the whole situation. Or at its end, will still affect the whole situation. But at the, let's go to the beginning and see. If I know that E lowers my energy, what if I put the letter B very shortly at the beginning, B, like that, B, and then continue with E, B, and go like this. So here, I say B, you see? So now the B has changed, the quality of the B has changed the E, it goes all the way to the end. Now let's make another experiment. Now, I'm going to say the E and put the B at the end, not in the beginning. Let's see if the end affects the beginning. So now I say E with the B at the end. But then you tell me it's not at the end, it's at the beginning, because from the beginning you have the intention of putting the B at the end. So we devised an experiment where we take away this, where we really have the endpoint effect and see what happens. So we write the letter B on one piece of paper and leave the other piece of paper empty. Put them upside down on the table and shuffle them. And then I start saying E. I just say E and continue. Now, at a certain point, before I end, a person takes one of the two pieces of paper and lifts it up to me. If it has a B, I end with a B. If it's empty paper, I end with nothing. So we did this experiment. So I start saying, for example, like this, and then I say, E and if from the beginning while I'm saying E, I don't know what's going to happen. If it's turning, increasing my energy, I know that when they shuffle and bring out the paper, it has to be a B. Because that's the future affecting the present. So I, I say E and as going like this, at a certain time they pick up the paper, it will be a B. And I can do the opposite. Sometimes if I start from the beginning and say uh, E and it drops down E and then somebody picks the paper, lifts it, shows me, it will be empty, the empty paper. So you see, there's no way of knowing th what the end effect is because the person hasn't chosen it yet, hasn't touched it yet. But the moment he touches the paper, lifts it up, it's when it affects. But I have the effect, I see the effect from the beginning. So this is how the end affects the beginning as the beginning affects the end. So everything in your life, in, in your future, in your end, is affecting your present state. So not only is your past affecting your present state, but your future is affecting your present state and it is influencing you to go towards that future. So you see, so the future is influencing the past and the past is influencing the future. That happens when you are in the right brain mode. So your heart in the right brain mode, when you have multiple time, is aware of the past and the future and how they are both interconnected in a universal uh, construct. In the left brain, no. In the left brain, it's just linear. It shows today, tomorrow, and afterwards, and all that. So, we went through a little journey now uh, around our uh, duality, psyche, and creation, and all that. It's a, a very complex thing because many people, when they started reading the book, the moment they saw Psychon, uh, Zeron, and all that, they got perplexed and they said, I, I can't understand anything and all that. So it is because it's, the mind cannot easily go beyond time and space. But 
I hope that with this, I have shown you that it's not a problem at all doing this. And if you had missed in the book in the beginning, you can still continue and come back to it any time. And every time you come back to it, you'll discover something more. So with this, uh, I will end this first session. And uh, I hope to see you again when we start the third session. This is the second session. Our third session will deal with perceived reality. And see you again soon. Thank you.